Hey guys, I've got 14 minutes before my camera gives out because it'll either run out of memory or it'll run out of battery. My tongue hurts. So... Oh... What shall I talk to you about today? Hmm. Well, it's been a while since I gave you a lesson. <laughs> so, science, bitches, I guess. No, no, I can be more enthusiastic than that. Science, bitches! Ugh. It's too hot to give a damn. Black holes. That's the topic today. Black holes. Excruciatingly dense mass in a teeny tiny speck. Pretty disastrous in their gravitational efforts. Now, as most of you already know, a black hole is, in essence, a dead star, or what remains of a star after it died. What you may not know is that for, for this to occur, the star in question needs to have upwards of, I believe, Eight solar masses, maybe thirteen, but I mean, effectively, anything could be a black hole if it were compressed enough. There's this thing called the I think it's called the Schwarzschild radius, which is linked to the Schwarzschild species of black hole which are by far the most common. It's... the maths behind it is really complicated, but effectively, any amount of mass, if condensed past a certain point, would be so enthralled by its own gravity that it would compress itself to a singularity. And the Schwarzschild radius is the radius, the spherical radius it would have to be compressed beyond in order for that to occur. Um, this crappy old mobile, for instance, weighs about 70 grams. So, it would have to be compressed really, really, really far. So far, in fact, that if it did become a black hole, that black hole would only be able to swallow maybe one electron every thousand years. So it would very quickly evaporate due to um, Hawking radiation. Now, a star, on the other hand, is effectively a gigantic fusion reactor. You see, a star is forever in a balance of exploding and collapsing. It is expanding, being pushed outwards by the radioactive energy from the fusion reaction in its core, um, while also trying to collapse under its own gravity. Once all the hydrogen in its core has been smooshed and fused into helium, it 
won't be able to fuse anymore, so its gravity takes over and it begins to collapse. Once it's collapsed to a certain point, the density is high enough that the helium can start to fuse into lithium. And then it goes on and on in this fashion for a while. Until it reaches such dense elements that they cannot normally be produced through fusion. Iron, for instance, is about this threshold. So in order to fuse into iron and all subsequent elements, it has to... it ends up collapsing very far. And then it explodes in a supernova and fuses all these subsequent elements very, very quickly, which then get flung across the universe. Effectively, everything on this planet is just flung from the death of a star. All matter upwards of hydrogen is star guts from giant corpses. Now, while the, um, I mean, you see, every time it goes into a new phase of fusion, it ends up much larger because it produces much more energy in the fusion, but it's also much more difficult for it to sustain, so it goes much more quickly. That's what a supernova is. A lot of fusion happening very, very quickly. So instead of it being a sustainable, balanced thing, it tears itself apart. Massive explosion, and anything that doesn't explode, well, no, the whole star explodes, but then it all starts to collapse again. Ugh, I'm explaining this rather poorly. Star go boom, star go shrink. Eh? That's incredibly vague. The star in question, having fused all that it can fuse in a tremendous explosion, all that mass and energy being flung outwards, but, well remember I said they're sustained by a balance between um, radiation pushing out and gravity pulling in. When this balance is exceeded, most of the star gets flung out into space, and what's left simply can't fuse anymore, and so it starts to degrade and collapse upon itself under its own gravity. Um, if it is heavy enough to produce a supernova, but not so heavy that it would collapse fully into a singularity, it will kind of balance itself again. Very small, actually. Um, it depends on the exact size of the star, but it would produce something... Well, it would certainly be smaller than the planet. Our planet, by which I mean. So, this unbelievably hot, unbelievably bright ball of dead stars is... dead star stuff is just kind of... well, you see this... The, all the atoms and molecules got fucked up by the explosion and they start to degrade and 
fuse and smoosh and do weird stuff and um, eventually they become uh, neutrons or they all explode and only neutrons are I don't know neutrons happen there are a lot of neutrons in a very dense space and they get smooshed into a weird it's kind of like plasma but it's just made of neutrons. This stuff is called neutronium. And this object, this body, is a neutron star. Which produces... Um, it, it, it kind of spins really rapidly. And um, it sends out x-rays at its poles which spin into pulses, hence the name Pulsar. But I think maybe not all neutron stars end up pulsing. It's complicated. But if it weighs... You see, it's quite a fine balance, you know? Everything fuses and ends up I don't understand quite why it's not regular matter, why it's not atoms and molecules anymore, it's just neutrons. What happened to the protons? What happened to the electrons? Well, perhaps the electrons got flung out by the explosion. I don't remember, and I probably should have researched this. I'm wasting time. I'm on a time limit. Um, if it's too heavy for it to become a neutron star, it collapses further and it accelerates and it keeps accelerating and it keeps collapsing until a well I think it's only the core of the star that's left yes that makes sense it would be a naked core of the star that had all the rest of it flung out by the supernova. And so it's a, quite a lot lighter than it was before. The original star will have been upwards of around 12 to 13 solar masses, or anything exceeding that amount. And then what's left of it would be maybe uh, one or two solar masses but it's very dense it's about the size of Pittsburgh and it's very very hot and it's very very dense and its gravity is something else so it collapses, and it collapses further and further, and it gets hotter and hotter, and it gets denser and denser, and the gravity gets more and more extreme because it's getting more energetic, because it's accelerating further and further. Eventually, all that matter that's accelerating towards its center of gravity exceeds the speed of light. And then it collapses down to a singularity. And effectively what you've got now is a black hole. The singularity contains all that mass that was left by the supernova. And so there's a shadow around it, if you like. The black hole is the area around the singularity that is Well, being hyper-accelerated, you know, space and time get f so twisted up, you know? It's such an extreme warping of space-time that um, anything that goes past a certain point would accelerate past the speed of light. Which is why they appear to be black, because any matter that's falling into them, any light produced or reflected off that matter, would never escape. 
And so, they produce no light. They have a few distinct varieties, and the factors that determine which it will become are vary around its mass and how quickly it's spinning and things. Which are actually quite tightly linked, you know? Um, your default black hole has a singularity at a point and an event horizon around it in a sphere. And that's the line between regular space-time and relativistic space-time that's being distorted wildly. Um, it will have poles and an equator determined by its direction of rotation, so that the equator is the halfway point in its spinning. And it's, due to the conservation of angular momentum, it will most likely be spinning um, relative to the speed of the rotation of the star that birthed it. But because it's a lot denser and more energetic, it will be spinning faster. Um, matter that gets pulled in along the equator is spinning too, and this matter accretes out into a disk called an accretion disk. And as it gets closer, it spins faster and gets hotter and hotter. So the edge of that, the inner edge of that disk, would be very, very bright and very, very hot, and would get. Um, but would then pass the event horizon and be lost to us in terms of what it looks like. <sighs> Contrary to popular belief, they do not suck. They are not cosmic vacuum cleaners. They are just an example of supergravity. And spiral galaxies, if not all galaxies, but spirals have the most obvious form, are, in fact, the accretion disk of a supermassive black hole. A black hole with upwards of... God knows how many solar masses. But is able to consume maybe a hundred thousand solar masses per year. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, there's um, actually a theory that the end of the universe will be all of the black holes being having eaten so much that they become so large that they swallow all the other black holes and the entire universe is compressed back into a singularity again. And then built on that theory is the theory that they will then expand back out again. But there are also other theories because um, space-time is expanding at greater than the speed of light, so it's unlikely that matter would accelerate back towards itself again. Unless, you know, I mean, Black holes collide, and then they swallow each other, and their singularities fuse, and you get one singularity with the combined mass of both black holes. And the mass of a black hole is the mass that birthed it, plus however much it has eaten since being birthed, minus uh, an amount variant upon Hawking radiation and the time it has been alive. So... By this I mean, there are these particles that pop in and out of existence every so often. I'm not sure where they come from. Someone else might know, but I'm not sure anyone does. These are tiny particles, positively and negatively charged, which 
smoosh and burst and just kind of annihilate. But, uh, you see, they behave in a really weird way. Like with anti gravity, it's strange. The positive one repels matter, and the negative one attracts it. So they attract each other, and then they annihilate. But if they get close to a black hole, the positive one would get flung away, and the negative one would get pulled in, and then a tiny part of the black hole would get evaporated. And so eventually, if a black hole reaches a point where there's nothing within its gravitational field that it can eat, it will begin to shrink back down again due to Hawking radiation. <sighs> due to these negative particles coming in and burning part of it away. Eventually, it'll fizzle out and burst in, I imagine, quite a lot of energy all at once. It would probably... Because any energy that comes from the annihilation effect would be held within it until such time as all of it is gone, and then it would burst out in this insane thing. Massive burst of pure energy. Although, I don't know how much energy we'd get from... I don't know. It would probably be very bright for an instant and then just gone. <laughs> anyway, um... These basic black holes that I started telling you about, point, horizon, maybe an accretion disk, two poles, equator, you get it. These are Schwarzschild black holes. Nortman black holes spin much faster and have developed a second event horizon, and I don't know what that means. What? Does it go faster than the speed of light twice over? That it's really strange. I don't get it. The event horizon is the point after which stuff is accelerated past the speed of light, so I don't know what the second event horizon would be. But it's there. And again, point for singularity, poles, equator, accretion disk. This is Nortman. The third is the Kerr black hole which spins very, very quickly. It has a singularity that has been stretched out into a ring, and I don't know what that means exactly, <laughs> except that I guess if you approached it, you would get exploded, and then your exploded parts would be drawn to the stretched out singularity. So it would kind of act like it was spherical rather than a single point. Which is confusing to me because it's a singularity, but whatever. And then you have two event horizons again, and then this weird kind of ovular thing, like an energy field. And I don't know what that does, and I can't remember what it's called. Air. Um, yeah, that's that's bit, that's the gist of it. Black holes, horrible, horrible things used to give me nightmares, but now I've accepted them. They're still kind of terrifying, but they're so far away that they can't really hurt us. You know? Yet. One day we'll be flying around in space and we'll have to actually deal with this kind of crap. If you see one, 
stay the hell away from it. That should be the protocol. Although, there would be a kind of... There would be a balancing point where, provided you were moving fast enough, you could effectively orbit a black hole without falling in, if you were far enough away from it. You could be on its gravity, you could be in its gravitational field, and moving at a speed that allows you to maintain a constant distance from it. Um, and if you started to move towards it, you would accelerate, so you would probably get flung out again. You, you would maintain a, quite a nice orbit. You could maintain a nice orbit around a black hole without it being an issue. Um, in fact, a lot of matter close to the galactic core does that. Which is why the galactic core is like a bright spot, like a spherical bright thing. If the spiral of the galaxy is the accretion disk, then this galactic core is all the crap orbiting that isn't falling in. Which is weird. So I guess you'd have your accretion disk, your galactic core, which I've drawn really big, it's actually, you know, so... Disc, core, hole. And given how freaking huge a supermassive black hole must be... Hmm, weird. I mean, the speed you'd have to move would vary depending on how close you were to it. And the angle of your momentum would have to be such a way that you wouldn't ever collide with it. If so, uh, if you were spiraling even slightly, y you'd fall in. So you'd have to adjust. It would be rather difficult to configure, but it would be possible. And the closer you're going, the faster you'd have to move to maintain orbit. And that's that. That's uh, basically the whole thing. The whole shebang. If you have any questions, please leave them in the comments below. If you want something specific for me to talk about in a future episode, just tell me. Okay, bye!